Let's say we want to conduct an experiment to study how an object interacts with the Mark 2.5 flow. To do this experiment, we would obviously need to create a uniform Mark 2.5 flow. So we start with the converging diverging nozzle with an area ratio of 2.6 and we also need to establish a pressure ratio of 17.09 across the nozzle for a shock free expansion of Mark 2.5 at the exit. If we exhaust the nozzle directly into the lab, then the Mark 2.5 flow passes on the test model as a free jet. For the jet to be free of any shock or expansion waves, the nozzle exit pressure PE must be equal to the back pressure PB, which in this case would be the ambient pressure in the lab or the atmospheric pressure. This would mean that the inlet of our CD nozzle would need a pressure reservoir of 17 atmospheres. Such a setup would be very expensive to build and operate due to the higher costs associated with such high pressure reservoirs and devices. So the question is, can we accomplish this more efficiently and economically? Let's find out. Let us modify our setup so that the nozzle exits the flow into a constant area section instead of a free jet directly into the lab. And let's say this constant area section contains a normal shock wave standing at the end of the constant area section. Now due to this, the pressure downstream of the normal shock is one atmosphere as we know. And at Mark 2.5, the static pressure ratio across the shock will be 7.125, which means the pressure at the nozzle exit is 0.14 atmosphere. Therefore, the pressure required at the nozzle inlet to ensure proper isentropic flow reduces from 17 atmospheres to 2.4 atmospheres. In this case, the normal shock wave helps by slowing the air from Mark 2.5 to Mark 0.5 behind the shock. And as a result, the setup is also referred to as a normal shock diffuser. Any duct designed to slow down incoming gas flow to a lower velocity is called a diffuser. This incoming flow can be either subsonic or supersonic depending on the application. It is designed in such a way that the loss in total pressure is minimal during the slowing down of the flow. Diffusers are commonly found in propulsion systems such as air breathing engines, rocket engines, and in wind tunnels. In fact, diffusers are an integral part of many wind tunnel designs. If we consider an ideal diffuser, the one in which the incoming flow is slowed via an isentropic compression to lower velocities, the supersonic flow entering the diffuser is isentropically compressed in the convergent duct to Mark 1 at the throat and is then further isentropically compressed in a divergent duct to a low subsonic Mark number at the exit. However, the flow will inherently generate oblique shocks in the converging portion of the diffuser as the flow is being turned into itself. Moreover, as the flow is viscous, there will be an entropy increase within the boundary layers on the walls of the diffuser. For this reason, an ideal diffuser can never be constructed for engineering applications. So, how does an actual diffuser work? Well, an actual supersonic diffuser slows down an incoming flow by a series of reflected oblique shocks in the convergent section and the throat. The throat is usually in the form of a constant area section. The interaction of shock waves and the viscous flows near the wall weakens and diffuses the reflected shock patterns. Many times, it ends up in the form of a weak normal shock wave at the end of the constant area throat. The subsonic flow downstream of the throat is subsequently slowed down via a diverging section. As the flow is no longer isentropic, the entropy at the exit is higher 
and the total pressure is lower. Therefore, the design problem of a diffuser can be summed up as the process of designing the converging constant area and the diverging section to obtain the desired exit mark number with the least possible total pressure loss. Now that we have some understanding of the design and operating principles of diffusers, let us revisit our wind tunnel. Hold on, before we can start building the setup for our experiment, there are few issues that we still need to consider. Firstly, a normal shock is the strongest possible shock which creates the largest pressure loss. So maybe if we can replace it with weaker shocks, then we can help reduce the total pressure loss and the required reservoir pressure. Moreover, the flow unsteadiness and instabilities can cause the normal shock to move and fluctuate constantly. This will give rise to uncertainty about the quality and the quantity of the flow in the constant area test section of the wind tunnel. And lastly, just the introduction of test model in the test section would cause oblique shock waves from the model to propagate downstream making the flow three-dimensional and causing the normal shock to vanish. So how do we address these concerns while keeping the reservoir pressure low? Let us replace the normal shock diffuser with an oblique shock diffuser as shown here. In this setup, we have a converging diverging diffuser which slows the flow down to a low subsonic speed. This way, we are effectively reducing the velocity of the supersonic flow via consecutive oblique shocks to a low supersonic value and further reducing it to subsonic speeds across a normal shock. This results in a smaller total pressure loss compared to a single normal shock. This arrangement is referred to as a supersonic wind tunnel. The main source of pressure loss here is the diffuser. As we can see, our supersonic wind tunnel has two throats. The nozzle throat within area 81 called the first throat and the diffuser throat within area 82 called the second throat. For maintaining a steady flow through the wind tunnel, we must ensure the following condition. Since the thermodynamic state of the gas is irreversibly changed when going through shock waves, the properties at the two locations will differ and thus the two throats must have different areas. If we assume sonic flow at both stations 1 and 2, we can get the following relation using the isentropic equations. Since the total pressure always decreases across shock waves, P02 is less than P01 and thus the second throat must always be larger than the first throat. Now that we have our diffuser ready for the wind tunnel experiment, we now need some metric to evaluate its performance. The most commonly used definition of diffuser efficiency related to wind tunnel work is based on the comparison of the actual total pressure ratio across the diffuser with the total pressure ratio across a hypothetical normal shock wave at the test section mark number. For typical supersonic diffusers, the efficiency is very sensitive to the second throat area AT2 as shown here. As we can see, the peak efficiency is obtained for a value of AT2 slightly larger than the value AT2 star obtained using this expression. For any value below AT2 star, the flow is choked and the efficiency drops significantly. An oblique shock diffuser is usually more efficient than a normal shock diffuser. However, this may not always be true due to the presence of shock wave boundary layer interactions and the screen friction exerted on the surface. So let's start our wind tunnel and see what happens. As the flow through the wind tunnel is first started, a complicated transient flow pattern is established, which after some time settles to a steady flow as we have discussed. 
In most cases, the starting process is usually accompanied by a normal shock wave traversing through the entire duct, from the nozzle entrance all the way to the diffuser exit. When this starting shock wave is at the inlet to the diffuser, the second throat area must be large enough to allow the passage of the mass flow behind a normal shock. This value is given by AT2 star corresponding to the total pressure ratio across a normal shock at the test section mark number P02 by P01. One very important thing to note here is that the starting value of the throat area is always larger than the corresponding to the peak efficiency. If AT2 is less than the starting value, the normal shock will remain upstream of the diffuser and the wind tunnel will not start. If AT2 is equal to or more than this value, then the normal shock will proceed through the diffuser section and the wind tunnel will start properly. This is the reason why many advanced wind tunnels use variable geometry diffusers. With this, we have come to the end of this lesson.